Hi, I want to welcome, welcome you to um, Snowbird's Welcome, which is our latest edition of Toll TV. I hope you enjoy this project. We've used Rocklawn and we've done some cutout along the bottom. You can make it into a banner, you can make it into a table runner. If I was doing a table runner, I would maybe leave out the Snowbird's Welcome and repeat the bird at each end, maybe. Um, anyway, it's a fun project. I've got a lot of techniques in here, um, so enjoy. All right, the very first thing that we're going to do for our project is we're going to build our background. Um, I really, I went through the Winter Edition book, and as I was going through, this is um, the Creative Expressions Winter Edition book, and it's all winter words, all styled by um, professional graphic artist people. Um, and I went through this, and I kept coming back to this front cover. I wanted to paint a little cardinal on some greenery, and I love how there's stencils and words and everything all crispy, bluey, kind of looking all over the place. So I think I'm going to use this as my inspiration. All of these words are in the book, and then I'll just resize them to fit my canvas or whatever. Um, they're on the disc, so you've got a disc right here that, will, um, that you can use the PDFs or the JPEGs on your computer and resize any size you want. I use my copy machine more. Um, I'm better at that. Um, totally understand not being up on the, the stuff, but I know a lot of you are very comfortable with technology. So I'm going to use this as my inspiration, and the very first thing we need to do is size our um, Rocklon. We're going to use Rocklon. Rocklon is spelled R-O-C-L-O-N, and it is available on the website. It is also available at Joann's. Okay, Rocklon is a flexible... Um, drapery lining fabric um, and it has a canvasy side and it has a smooth rubbery side. Today I think I'll be painting on the smooth rubbery side. And then I have, let's see if I can get you back a little bit further, I have these fantastic and they're impossible to show on camera when I'm set up like this but I'll try, I'll set it sideways. So I have this fantastic, um, Let's see, it's a stand for banners and it goes along and rah, let's get it down there. Okay, there we are. Um, this one has got a bird house topper and I think that might be the one. It has these wonderful, I can take them apart. I can take them apart if I haven't shoved them together too hard. There we go. Okay, so there's a square. It's like, um, I don't know, maybe like 11 by 20 or something like that. And then the dimensions are on the website. And there's another square, and I can stack it on top of this one, and it all hooks together. Okay, and it's got legs that pop off so it's easy to ship. Um, and then it's got toppers, and there's mittens for winter. And then because I'm painting birds, I thought maybe I might go here. I don't know if I'm going to go which one I'm going to go yet. But um, I could use either one, so I don't have to decide. But I like this because I can stand it in my house, um, you know, near the door or on the front porch or something like that where it can be more protected. Rock lawn can go outside. You want to use an exterior grade varnish. Um, you want to make sure you varnish both sides. Don't over varnish rock lawn or it gets too stiff. Okay, so um, when you are doing this, I kind of wanted to make this a table runner as well, but I'm running out of time, so I decided to do just one thing today. I want to size this. That's not going to be, I haven't got enough fabric here, so I'm going to have to go in this direction. Let's see how much I need, and then I'll measure. And So what I'm doing is I'm just laying my, I want to have enough get an approximate size here, and then I'll have to square it up. Um, when you cut your rock lawn, when you cut your rock line, you have to make sure that you um, that you allow enough room to fold over and attach it to whatever you're going to hang it from. So, like, give yourself two or three inches extra. Okay, then I'm going to pull out some of my tools for cutting. Um, one of them is a T-square. If you have astigmatism, you absolutely need to have a T-square. This T-square has tape on the back of it because you can also use them for... Um, using it with your liner to um, line and make really nice straight lines, but you have to put tape on there to support it. Okay, let's get all my junk out of the way. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to find out how 
That's how wide it is. So how wide is that? Let's measure that. And it is exactly the length of my ruler. And then I'll just verify that that is a true statement. You know, it is the length of my ruler, but I think to leave room for hanging, I think I'm going to make it um, 11 inches. Would 11 be too tiny? Let's see. Yeah, I think 11 will be fine. So I'm going to make it 11 inches wide. And I am going to give myself room to hang it. Give it a fold over. And give yourself, on this project, give yourself a little bit of extra um, length. I'm planning, I'm planning on making it so that um, we cut out something at the bottom. So you want to give yourself a little bit of extra to each side and a little bit of extra on the bottom. Got to get rid of these stoppers. They're in my way. Okay. Make sure I'm square. So I'm using my T-square. Let's get this extra piece of rock bar over here. Rockland stores so fantastically. Just use a skirt hanger or a pants hanger and you are good to go. So I'm going to use my T-square, or my L-square, sorry, to make sure that my side is nice and straight. If you are not nice and straight, you're going to know it right away. And so I'm going to square up on the bottom. Make sure that that is also square. Seems to be pretty good. All right, now I'll come over here, and I'm going to give myself that little bit of extra space that I talked about. And I haven't measured it distance-wise. It's going to depend on you. Um, I'll put the dimensions in the pattern and stuff. But if you're not using the same stand that I'm using, then you're going to want a different size. So um, always make sure that you... Um, Resize according to how you need to. You know, obviously you can resize the pattern and all that as well. Let's see if I get this line down in that direction. Okay, so I'll get it square and then I'll cut it with the coarse scissors. I don't know that that's going to be perfectly lined up, but I'm not sure it was perfectly lined up at the top. So we'll meet in the middle. Okay. By the time I'm done with my snowflakes, I'm not going to care about that little bit of deviation. All right, so we'll get nice sharp scissors. That was my line. That's my fold. A little bit extra down here. Okay, I think I'm good to go. I'm going to cut it out, and I'll have my working piece. I wanted to share with you, we have um, these artist um, storage Lazy Susans. <clears throat> I love my measuring tools. There's my L square. There's my T square. I've got all my measuring tools in one place. I've got my sponges and my cleaning supplies in another place. Um, all of my ghost writers and my misting bottles and things. Um, I've got them all organized. I've got my cutting tools down in the drawer. It's down here. The Lazy Susan part comes off, so if you want it to hang flat, they come in, they have brand new colors for the spring um, coming up here. Um, they have, I just room, this is a 24 inch, um, let's see if we can get it on camera, 24 inch piece of yellow tracing paper. It holds everything and it takes up just a small footprint. You'll see me reaching over there from time to time and it's just awesome. Okay, so I'm going to use a little foam roller. Um, they come with blue heads and black heads. Um, the two inch size is brilliant. You can't find it anywhere. So um, the four inch is just a little bit too big for decorative painting. The foamy head allows you to finish boxes and things like that um, because you can put paint on the end and press it in and it finishes the where they join really well. Um, the differences in the heads just are different finishes that you can get. I'm going to need a clean one. Okay. And you'll see frequently I put my the heads of my rollers in a baggie. If you don't seal out the air by rolling it nice and tight, then it gets hard. I've actually got hard edges on this and this. So you do want to make sure if you put them in bags to close them down nicely so that they um, last. We're going to use winter blue and we're going to use cool white. I'm just going to put some on the middle here. Winter blue is just a little bit too, 
Oh, it's a little bit dull for me. I think it'll be pretty when we get it done. So I want white in it to just kind of jazz it up just a little bit. I'm going to mix right on my palette, or right on my um, project. <clears throat> This will just start the layering effect. I'm going to be careful with rollers. They tend have a tendency to spit. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to put one coat of your blue down, um, or whatever your background color is going to be. I've got craft paper on my desk, which I'm just going to go ahead and mess up. You want to do your back and your front at the same time so that you don't have to repair um, anything. So get your back base coated while you have um, nothing painted on the front. It's much simpler. Anyway, if you normally, because this is a white background and I'm going to be mixing white in with my blue, this step is not as necessary. Normally though, you would put your base color down before you start slip slapping in it because it will lift as you paint and you don't want it to lift. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it like you should do it and then I'll add my, my white to the next step. <clears throat> and I'll let that dry as well. Okay, while we're waiting for the paint to dry, I'm going to get out primary blue. I'm going to mix some white. This is cool white. Get my palette knife out. Always mix just a little of your dark color into your light color. I want just something, look how much that pigmented that. Okay. So see, this is a much crispy, clearer blue than that is. So I'm gonna go ahead and slip slap with a little bit of this as well. I want a cold winter day blue not a dreary blue. So that'll make a good base and then we'll use this as a, as a slip slap color. Okay, I've got that dry. Now I'm going to re-wet it with the winter blue. And I can have a little bit of water in my roller, just a little bit to keep it wet and moving if I wanted to. Okay, so we'll go up here first. So I'll just dip my roller into a little bit of water. Roll it off on a paper towel because it's just a little bit much. And be careful of spitting. Remember these things like to spit. Okay, so we'll get that rolled and wet. It'll take a little bit longer to dry next time. The reason I want to reapply the winter blue is because the winter blue um, will mix with the other colors as long as it stays wet. So, But I want winter blue in my roller. I want it on my piece so that it mixes and blends the colors and makes everybody sit well together. Okay, we'll get everything all wet and smooched. This is a fairly long piece. Um, it makes it a little bit awkward for filming. When I get to the end of my um, surface, I roll to the end and don't roll back because it'll grab it and roll it up in your roller just like that. Okay, I'm going to move this back up. I'm going to roll into a little bit of my brighter blue and then I'm going to start roller slip slapping that into the background with that blue. Don't want it everywhere, it's just maybe a little bit too bright by itself, but as a mix, I think it's going to be brilliant. Definitely don't want it just solid this color, that would be way too much. Roller slip slap is just me going in X's on the piece. I'm just going to keep moving. We'll work in one color and then we'll bring in the cool white. And if you notice, um, as I get slip slapping, the 
darker blue or the base blue starts swallowing up my bright blue. So it's important um, to kind of keep reloading it even though you might have enough paint on your roller. Now I'm going to load the toe or the front end of the brush or the roller into my white. And I'm just going to slip slap here and there. an interesting background. I don't want to leave a bunch of polka dots, so I will roll it around. Okay. It helps to stand, like I was just sat down and that I can't see my, but I can't get distance on it to see how it's blending, to see what kind of look I've got going. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a pokey dot system. I'm going to take my roller and I'm going to squeeze out any extra water now because now we want a little bit more control. So just come over here, roll this up. Squeeze out, it'll come out extra paint and everything. Okay, but now I want, I want the paint to be where I want the paint, not just a preform kind of thing. My polka dots have goo. Alright, now what I want is a little bit darker in this blue and I'm going to use it sparingly. I want to use it to darken up that edge. I think I'm going to mix some of the winter blue into it just to tone it down just a smidge. The winter blue definitely leans to a gray color. Okay. Now we've got a medium, let's see, let's use our mixing mat. We've got a grayscale on the mixing mat. I would say, mixing wise, we are looking at someplace in the middle here, about a five on your grayscale. This is just a mat that you can mix on with a gl glass palette, and then it's got color instruction on the back. Grayscale is probably a conversation for a different um, disc. Okay. So now I'm still wet, which is perfect. If you were dry, then it wouldn't blend. I'm going to go very gently pressured on my edges and just bring in some of that darker blue around my edges, like almost like antiquing. Okay, so do you see how that's just bringing that in? I'm going to roll it back and forth. I've only got that blue on the toe of the brush, and that means that it's not if I don't get it on this part right here, I can use that part just to soften and blend. Okay, so I'll just bring it out there. Just kind of walking it gently. My pressure is almost non-existent. Now what would happen if I got that blue too far in? That's easy. What you would simply do is you would bring back the other colors and just scooch it back. I'm going to get it all the way to the edge, even though I'm going to do some funny things with my edges. I don't want, I don't want to leave it, I don't want to leave a problem for myself. So even though I know kind of what I'm doing, I know that maybe I might change my mind and I want to make sure I don't have any problems changing my mind. Like I leave that path open. So all the way to the edges. The edges are extended out a little bit. If you recall, when I was measuring, um, it's just a little bit bigger than I intend it to be. So make sure that your most beautiful stuff isn't right along the edge if that's what you've done too. Because we will be cutting some of that off and doing a fun technique. So I'm using, now I'm going to bring this into my piece just a little bit here and there. I could load my toe into some white button right now. I think I'm liking what I'm doing. Lift that up. Walking it in just a little bit more to make sure I'm not going to trim off everything that I've done. I'm blending on my palette because some of my paint wasn't quite mixed in, so I want to make sure that I'm not going to have 
big scary spots. Now I'm going to go into white and blend on the palette. You can see here, as I blend, it mixes it in. And we'll just work in some of this lighter stuff. Got a little piece of blue on there. So making me some polka dots. I don't want any polka dots. So this is just another layer. This is just fun. Just go have fun with it. Okay, tone that down. Okay. Now I'll get a plastic baggie and put my roller in it. Pinch out all that air. Because I'm not certain I'm done with it yet. That's actually, you know, take it off the handle and that preserves it a lot better. I'm gonna just roll it up nice and tight. Now that'll sit there for weeks if it doesn't have air in it. Air is actually what dries um, paint. It's an oxidation process. So if you have air touching paint, it's going to dry. So next, what do I want to do now? While I've got it and it's wet, I'm going to go ahead and spatter. To spatter, I use a white wonder brush, which is like a big kind of a rake with a longer head to it. I'm going to get into my blue, make it very, very watery. Now the kind of spattering I'm going to do right now is the kind of spattering that is like snow spattering, but it's kind of controlled. So watch yourself when you're doing it. I'm going to use a heavy handled brush, not as big fat number one type thing. And I'm going to tap off on my palette. It's a little bit dark, so let me lighten it. With some white. Set it down. And have this a little bit dark or a little bit light. I'm going to go with something in the middle here. I don't want it in the middle. I want it around these edges. So I'm pointing the brush to where I want it. I'll soften that. Go all the way around our edges. Try not to make patterns. This is a nice thing to do while you're waiting for everything to dry. Now, you can't, however, clean it up very easily, so if you're nervous about spattering, you might want to wait until it does dry. Very difficult to clean up on a wet piece. Okay, now I'm going to go into white and do the same thing. Thin it out, spatter over here, and up the middle, bridging into the area where the blue spatters are. We'll make this be snowflakey already. Spatters will get on everything in your painting room, so you do want to be sure that you are not spattering near stuff you care about. And don't spatter near your, your um, table mate's piece. Take it to another table. Okay, and I think we'll do one in the, towards the middle bridging area with this middle color. of my brush just fell into my paint. So let's talk about why the head of your brush falls into the paint. Um, when you leave, if you look at my brush, my poor brush, it has cracks all down all the paint. That means that I have left this sitting in water and I am guilty. Don't leave your brushes sitting in water because you ruin them. But this isn't a ruined brush. If you ever have any t at any time anybody's brush, where the head falls off, just take some craft glue, it's just the water has softened the glue, twist it back on and it'll be fine. And there I go, I set it right in the water, didn't I? Okay, now that I've got everything dry, I went ahead and painted the back in the blue. Um, what I noticed was that when you paint on 
um, the, the smooth side, um, I was getting a little bit of curling, but by painting the back with one base coat, it took care of that and got rid of it. So if you're getting a little curling, then do the um, other side. I'm going to use my triple threat pencil here, and it's going to mark my boundaries for my holder. I go ahead and marked it at the top, and then this has this will be erased with spit, with varnish, with water, with everything. Um, it'll erase your all of my, um, that's from doing my pattern. Now I have lovely graphite in the middle there. So I want to go ahead and measure. It's about an inch all the way in. I'll measure this all the way down, even, and then I'll know where I'm, and then I'll mark my fold at the top as well so that I know exactly where I'm going to be placing snowflakes and things like that. Okay, so I've got my lines all marked. Now what I, the reason I did this is I want to take my stencils, probably not the big one, I'm going to take my stencils and I want to have my stencil arms reach outside of my lines. So um, I want to know, I want to have blue here so that when I stencil on it, it'll be all base coated and everything and consistent. So I've given myself my boundaries and then I've got to decide what I want to do with the bottom if I want to cut it or just have it end bluntly. I haven't decided that yet. So I'll take a little break and I'll get back with you in a minute. All right, I've taken and marked a halfway mark on my my design, and I'm going to choose the stencil that I'd like. We've got these in a couple of different configurations. These are the jumbo ones, and they have a heavier body. We also have a thinner, finer one, um, and then we have smaller versions of each of them, and then we also have a flurries one that is a combination of all kinds of stuff. Right now, I'm just going to use these, and one of the things that I, in my brain, I have it that I want to do is I want to um, cut out a little bit of this outline around here. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it happen or not. That's what I want to do. Okay, so we'll just line this up. I want to break my border with my stencil. I'm going to break the border by cutting it out anyway. I have to open a new Gray Matters palette because I used my other one all up. When you flip open the top of this, take this off. It's your grayscale right here as well. So that's a free little piece that comes along with, um, and it's a great tool. Okay, so we're going to go. Got my stencil lined up. We're going to use, I think we'll stick with our cool white right now. Okay, and we're going to, I've got a neat little um, faux stencil brush. It's got a stick, which I like. Um, white's going to be way too white. Let's mix a little winter blue in with our white to tone it down. We don't want these stencils to be screaming off the map here. So we'll just mix a little bit of the two of them. Always stencil away from your puddle of paint so that you don't... Um, get way too much. Okay, here's my vote. I go right back to my makeup applicators. Those just don't have the body that we need them to have. They'd be great for other applications, but not my stenciling application. Uh, much better. A little bit more body, a little bit more um, pounce, if you will. Okay, I'm going to pick this up and just take a peek and see what I've got. Okay, so I, I guess I could like that. And then I'm going to do a bigger stencil. Let's see, let's do it in order. I've got, tack it over and over on the back side of it, and look at how nice it is. It doesn't leave any residue. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, product. Okay, for those of us who are Rock Alarm fans, I've been reflecting overnight um, about why I got a little bit of a curl when I did the front of this piece, and there's a couple differences from what I normally do. Now, I've been painting on Rock Alarm for about two years. I probably have painted 50 projects and taught 150 people how to do it. Um, probably more than that, actually, on the teaching. 
Um, but anyway, one of the things that um, I reflected on was I added water to my roller. Rocklon is kind of a non-porous kind of thing. It really tends to, it takes the paint a lot longer to dry on Rocklon because it doesn't soak in and evaporate that way. So when you are putting water on your rock line, you're going to want to let it dry completely, completely. And of course, I'm always in a hurry, so I always rush. Um, I won't even apologize for it at this point. But um, So I didn't maybe let it dry completely, but it did take care of it when I put paint on the back side of it. I'm not quite sure what that's all about, but I do know that any time I've ever done a floor cloth, you always want to finish both sides. So um, that's my little reflection. I don't know that I've resolved anything. If any of you have any other thoughts about it, let me know. Um, but I've always had really good luck with it laying flat and behaving exactly how it should. All right, so now um, I've got my bird drawn, and I've got them a couple of different sizes. And this is one of the things I encourage you to do. This is my original, um, my original drawing. And then it, I drew it out way too big, even though I had marked my space. Um, and, but that's not a problem. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've reduced him into a couple different sizes. And now what I can do is I can lay him in there. That's just going to be too darn small. And I think that's going to be too darn big. And so we'll go with the one in the middle here. But I can just file these in my bird file. And anytime I'm going to need another bird, I can just take that out. Um, if you're going to change the size of it, Always feel free to make a copy for your personal use to shrink and reduce or enlarge or whatever. Um, don't feel like you're stuck with the size of any pattern that comes along. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and trace my bird. I'm going to leave my um, rock lawn intact at this point. I always love to leave all my future decisions until I see how the, the, the hole is going to continue. So um, that's how you handle reducing and enlarging. We can make this canvas any size because um, it doesn't matter what size it is. You can get whatever size stencil you want and use that size stencil. Um, all of this is basically done without a pattern. You could put any size words in there from the words book um, or any phrase that you want. Um, I have gone against, I said in the beginning that I was going to do it all in words going just like the cover, but now that I've gotten my cute little bird drawn, um, I've kind of changed my mind, so that's okay. Um, that's also part of the fun. As I'm getting ready to trace, a couple of tricks that I'd like to share with you. Let's see if I can find my stuff. Is one, when you don't want your pattern to slide about, just poke a little hole there in the middle of it, and then you tape the hole and now your pattern won't shift and go. It just stays nice and flat. You could tape it in two spots if you wanted it really to be secure. Number two, we're on a light background and we need a very worn out piece of transfer paper. Um, this has got scribbly scribblies all over it and that is exactly what we want. If you don't have a worn out piece, then wipe off the residue. Okay, number three, on a light background, we want to make sure we're not pressing. I almost always cut my transfer paper into small sheets so that I have a place to put my hand. If you don't have a place to put your hand, put a piece of cardboard underneath on your pattern so that when you you don't want heel prints everywhere. The um, triple threat, I have been plagued for years and years. I have a death grip on my pencil. I hate to handwrite letters um, because somehow or another when I do this, I just like and so I get a big dent um, in my finger. Um, this is a triple threat gra um, um, tracing tool, and it has a three-in-one um, tool. It has a padded grip, and it has a large size grip, which I have to tell you, I, I love it. So, um, and it also has a gray ceramic lead on board and a white ceramic lead, which we will be using in just a little while. Um, there are other colors that come in singles, the gray and the white here. Um, the Ghost Riders, and they're fantastic as well. This one is obviously the most uniform. You could also make this whatever color lead and replace that lead with, say, pink or yellow, which we also carry. Um, I have all the pens just so that I have them ready to go. Um, this one is uniformly the best. If you can't afford them all, I would get this one. And then you'll just trace as normal. Make sure always to check your tracing to make sure that your graphite paper is right side up. I have done that more times over 20 years than I can even tell. One of the things that is cool about the tracing tool here is it's a roller ball without any um, ink in it. 
and you can actually feel it kind of punching in. And so it rolls over the surface instead of catching and it doesn't dent. It's actually designed specifically to work with fabrics. So when we're on Rockline, which has just a little bit of a dent ability to it, it's absolutely perfect. And then I'll just trace all my basic details. Okay, I don't even know if you'll be able to see this. I'm going to switch to my gray graphite. And my gray, it's not graphite, it's ceramic. It took me years to discover what this was actually made out of. Um, this is the stuff that erases, unlike your transfer paper, this um, ceramic lead erases with spit, varnish, erasers, water. Um, fantastic for designing and sketching and things like that. So what I have to decide now is how much additional detail I'm going to want on my bird to bring the colors down into where I think they ought to be. And so I'll just use my lead. I highly recommend this whenever you're painting, um, uh, what do you call them, um, vines. I've seen a lot of people wreck some, some projects doing their vining and stuff like that on a project. So. Do make sure you give yourself a little sketch. It'll all come off, um, and it's a, a nice way to adjust um, things before you actually paint them. So it's a real easily correctable way of doing things. Okay, so I've gone through the book a, a million more times to see which one. You know, I, there's so many, I don't know, words just inspire me. So there's so many great ones in here that I just want to be sure that I'm expressing the art correctly, what I want it to say. And I've decided that Snowbird's Welcome is the best one for me. Now, I've got to decide how big I want my letters, and the way that you do that is you get out your sizing tool, your sizing dial, and mine should be right here somewhere. Okay, then you need a ruler. So we'll have a ruler. Um, everything's laying. When I don't put things away, they don't get put back. Go figure. Okay, so it's about five inches wide for the snowbirds. And so I'm gonna want that to sit somewhere-ish up here in between my two lines. And you can't see, so I'll come up here. Somewhere up here between my two lines and maybe eight inches. So I want it to go from five inches to eight inches. So the original size is on the inner wheel, which was five. Okay, the size I want it to go to is eight. I'm going to line those two right across from each other on the inner and the outer wheel, and I'm going to need to increase it by 160%. It's all done for you. It's so simple. It's such an invaluable tool. So I'll just go to my copy machine, enlarge my snowbirds, 160%. Okay, as I'm trying to lay out the lines of my um, pattern, this pattern has a little bit of a lean to it, so I want to make sure I have an astigmatism I'm not sure if it's a stigmatism or an astigmatism, but anyway, I have one of those. And I want to make sure when I'm doing this that I figure out which one of these is laying straight and which one is cockeyed so I get it right. When I look at this in its original format, and I go with my T-square, I can get a better idea of where we're at. So the D, the B, and the N are kind of all on a line. That's what I'm going to use as my straight and level. So I'll just take my, and this is, um, what this is to do is you put the line across here and that tells you where you have a straight and level um, line at. And I know sometimes it can seem like um, I do an awful lot of talking about um, what tools I'm using and things like that. but. That's the way I get it done. If I was in a class teaching you, I would do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to get all these guys on a line. I want you to know all the stuff that I know as I'm teaching in this format. Okay, so then we take a look at it. We squint our eyes. We get a little space. And we tape it down. Tape is your friend. Do not tape if you can help it. Um, do not tape on either side, and I'll show you why. Okay, if I was to tape over here, okay, 
And what happens is you can get this kind of thing going on. Okay. If I was to tape it top and bottom, then you can't move your tracing paper, your transfer paper around in there. And when I pull your tape off of your tracing paper, you can expect it to rip. And I want to make sure I'm lined up still on the T. It's about straight. And then what I've also done is I've centered these letters. This is going to come separate in your pattern as a separate pattern um, right there. So um, when you do that, you're free to put it anywhere on your piece, but now you're seeing how I would place it. I'm looking for about the same amount of space here to here. I could move it over there. I'm liking how this fits with where I placed my snowflakes and things like that. Maybe I will move over just a hair. Check it one more time. Okay, I can like that. All right, and then I'll trace it. Sometimes I feel the process of getting ready to actually get going is, takes us forever. So I'm going to use a round brush and some water and cocoa and on my palette. So I'm going to get you both on here. This, with a wider project, it's a little bit harder to keep you on camera. Um, with water in my brush and make a nice runny mix of the cocoa and the water. I'm just going to sketch on, dry off my ferrule, I'm going to sketch on my branches. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is get some idea of where all my branches are going to be. Okay, so just get them on here. I've got my lines nice and soft, but I think it might be working against me. Notice that I'm fading that out as I get out over here to the edge. Now that's going to be where my border is anyway, but I don't want it to be a real dark, blunt line. Yep, I'm going to have to the pattern out. Okay, so this one comes behind him. I'm not going to run these through my bird, but I want to paint from the background. Um, and the reason I'm going to do this is because I don't want to worry about pine needles running into my bird and then maybe I'll make a very blunt pointed pine needle when I'm painting instead of making a very nice natural um, shaped pine needle. So same thing here. I don't want my branches to end or have the shading be funny because I'm worried about where things end. Okay, so I'll bring this down here. And I can run straight on through just to make sure that my lines are nice and even. Okay, so it's just with a wash. Um, you'll notice that it's irregular in color because you will be um, washes when they stop and start um, are always just kind of irregular in color. They um, they don't base coat, so they're not solid. So wherever you have thicker paint will appear thicker. Okay, so then this one's going to come through here. And you want the, the trees to get skinnier as they get further away from the trunk. Okay, so I'm making sure that I'm pressing down on my brush a little bit here. Now I'm giving you information like you don't have a pattern, but um, if you didn't have a pattern and you were wanting to know the theory behind it a little bit, then that's why and what I'm doing. I'm even adding a few little chunky things wherever I feel like I want them. Okay, so look at this main trunk thing here. It's coming straight on through. Keep adding water. I'm just adding water just to the little edge of my puddle of paint. I don't mix it to the, with the whole thing, and I'm brush mixing it. We don't need to worry about brush mixing. I'm using a round. I'm using the Pro Round, which is the finest round ever. Um, it's got a good price on it. It's not an expensive, expensive brush, but you will find it to be a fantastic brush. So where are my little guy's feet coming out here? Okay, he's landed on. So we'll just keep making our lines, bring them out. 
And if I don't like something as I'm painting and I decide, you know, I've got too many viney little things going on, um, I can very, very, very easily just dilute them out by using a little of my background color. I want things to be a little bit gnarly looking. Um, this is a tree, it's a trunk, it's got bark. Um, you don't want to do everything real smooth, so I will go back and I will give it some little bumps and jumps and things. Try to give them those as you go along. This is where actually the little bumps and jumps and things are where you can bring out other branches as well. Okay, so I know that this is where my pattern is going to end, and I know that I'm going to have greenery off of these, so I think that's enough down there. Then up here, just curling up my pattern, my project. I'm going to just bring that same thing off. Off the edge there and do exactly the same thing up here. Most of this isn't going to be seen. It'll be under everything else. But we do need that foundation. Um, to be able to see. Okay, I sketched these on, so I guess I'm going to sketch paint them. We need the foundation to be able to tell where to put our branches and our pine cone needles and our pine needles, and um, we need the colors to flow. So we want to see this coming through here, and we want to see it kind of meeting down here. So. We just need to make sure that we get a good, you know, just like music has to have rhythm, so does your painting. And I think that might be a little bit too far down right there, so I'll come out this direction. Your meeting of your two branches, your forks, need to be, um, have some weight to them. Don't make them be spindly um, letter-wise, you know what I'm saying? So make it make sure that it has some weight. And you don't want everybody to end at the same level, so mine's coming down a little bit here. But then see how this looks like a horrible, skinny little scrawny thing. So we'll come up here and it's gonna need some like one branch wouldn't just come off of there forever and ever like that. So let's make it have a couple of other things go on. A little bit of filler. Okay, and then that meets the head. So what I'm looking for is a little bit of flow as we go through this. I think that'll be fine. Now we'll go into our shade color, which is um, milk chocolate. Okay, I've put out my milk chocolate, and I've got my flat brush loaded for floating. Um, if you don't know how to float, it's a pretty um, important technique. It allows you to side load a brush and then shade to wherever you want to add shading or highlighting. In this case, we're going to shade, so we're using a darker color, which is the definition of shade. And I'm going to bring that along each side of the more important elements of the design. And notice I'm not going to worry about that stopping and starting there. We're going to have stuff around it. I just want to add a little bit of depth to it, make it look a little bit more dimensional. Let's see where his poor feet went. I think I lost my bird's feet. A technique that I love to use, I'll put this up here so you can see it, is the awesome water drop technique. Okay, the one of the techniques I love to use is the water drop technique. As you saw me floating, I need to keep that float flowing. Um, I'm going to take my little misting bottle. They're little vials that you can fill with different mediums. I've got water in this one. And as you squirt, let's get you in closer, 
different size water drops will appear. And this works on a waxy palette. And I've got the, um, the gray palette, the gray matters palette, so that you can um, mix your colors easier. But so let me show you, let me load. So I'm going to load into my paint on the corner. I'm going to blend, 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 just like I normally would. Now I'm going to go over here and dry it off on my paper towel, just like it would be like if I used up the water or the whatever. And then I can come over here and I can suck up just the right amount of moisture and continue blending on that same spot. It just pops it right into there. It's almost magical. And the neat thing about these little vials is you can put, these are called mini misters, you can put alcohol, water, get mine out, um, this one is unlabeled, I don't know what I have in that one, um, you can put um, extender, you can put brush cleaner, you can put all kinds of things in these, and then you can keep just a little bit instead of, you know, the ginormous bottle of whatever on your table, and then they squirt it out just enough, and um, they're very, very convenient. Okay, so that being said, we're going to continue floating. And so I'll just float to one side. I'll float all the one sides. And then I'll go back, and I'm turning my brush skinny, like almost on its chisel, as I get out to the point. I'll do all my one sides, and then I'll go back when they're dry, and I'll do the other one sides. So that I don't run into my float and make it, um, make it yucky, make it disappear, actually. Okay, so do all of our ones. In our, the crotch of the tree here. Notice that you're not listening to me. Um, you can't see the whole palette because I can't show you everything at one time. You're not listening to me clean my brush a lot. One of the things that you will love about using that water technique is that you will spend half the time you normally would just not cleaning your brush out all the time and reloading and refloating and redrawing and re-stabilizing. It's um, a big time saver. As well as I think, here's what I think, the floats get prettier the longer your brush is got the same mix on it. Now when you start getting out of control and it floats all the way across, it's time to stop, rinse your brush and start over again. And when I say out of control, I don't act like that doesn't happen to me. It's just as a matter of when, not a matter of if. Eventually, your brush is going to lose it, and you're going to need to redress it. But let's extend that time as much as we can. Oh, I just love the water drop. I'm, I'm so happy I put water drops out today. It's just like a happy little trick. I know that sounds silly, but once you try it, you're going to be like as hooked as me. Okay, so I seem to be ignoring this little branchy set right here. Get up here. If we, we could just have those washy, they'd be behind his head and all that. But I think just having a little kiss of that color on there I think is good. So this is these guys. And this is these guys. See how pale and kind of insipid they look. So that's them. And then that's these guys. So then we'll do exactly the same technique to these. And I will go ahead and do these off camera since they're like the exact same kind of drill. Now, one of the things that I have learned over the years, and you know, I'm self-taught, so you know, I pass along. I think I, the reason I feel so passionate about sharing um, information is because um, because I have had to struggle to learn everything. Um, one of the things that I have learned over the years is that the more detail you put into any one area, the more it's going to pop out. So right now I've got two details. I've got the wash and then I've got that shade. And I know I want my branch to retire, so I'm gonna stop here for this moment. Like my natural inclination would be to go ahead and dry brush up the middle, give it some roundness, and then maybe even deeper darkly shade in some of the areas to create more roundness. I think right now, I think we're gonna just pause at that moment at this place and I think we're going to just let it be what it is and then we'll see if it needs some more a little bit later. As my favorite, favorite, favorite piece of advice is if you're unsure, go back to it in a little while and like we're at the end and balance things out.
Okay, the next step we're about to take is that we're going to do our pine needles. I want to show you just a little bit about some stuff that I know. Okay, so we have, um, this is the new Studio Brush Basin. And I'm just going to show you this just briefly just because I think it is important. Um, this has this cool handle which you can carry your stuff around in. It has four places to put water in mediums. The last one is big enough to put your whole hand in. I usually put my um, sea sponge in here or my base coat sponge or my varnish sponge in here and squeeze it out and use that for loading dirty water, um, you know, for soaking things. Um, this has ridges across the bottom and so does this one and you can use it for cleaning your brushes. Use one of them for dirty water. I usually use the front one for my cleaner water, although in this case they both look pretty, pretty bad. Um, you can put your mediums in here. If you use extender or if you use color float or something like that, you can do that. It also stands up to our awesome brush cleaner, um, which is like the perfect miracle brush cleaner. But the reason that I brought this forward is we're about to go into a brush that I call the Ugly Brush. It's the Raphael uh, liner. And it looks like it's going to be super duper fat and thick, um, that it has a lot of bristles, a lot of hairs. Um, my normal liner of choice is the Mighty Fine liner. Let's get this out of the way so you can see the differences between them. Mighty Fine is very thin. Um, this is very fat. But this little fat part right there is called a belly on a brush. And that is what is going to help us not work so hard over here on all these pine needles. And you'll see what I mean. If I did it with the, this liner, it would make perfect thin, fine lines. That's what it's for. It's the perfect length for women's hands. That's awesome, great for a beginner. But um, what would happen is I'd have to reload, 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 reload. I'd have like a tension deficit of loading my brush. So with this one, whoops, hey, it vibrates. With this one, what I like to do is, this, these are made out of um, Sable, um, Klinsky, sorry, Klinsky, I think it's Sable, um, hairs. And just like natural hairs on our head, it likes, if you're going to get it wet, it likes to be wet for a minute before it'll start really soaking stuff up. This has little places on here for you to lay your brushes as you use them so that you can clean them when you're all done. Um, they won't roll away. Um, you know, they stay put. They're not in your way because you can still load all kinds of other stuff. In this case, I like to soak this in water. If you lean this, you will wreck this brush. You don't want to do that. So I'll put it in water, and I'm just going to let it sit there and get wet for, you know, four minutes, three minutes, something like that, just a few minutes. And then when I do that, it's going to line really, really well. It's the same thing as like a wet sponge will attract more water than a dry sponge. So that is how I'm going to rest my brush. It's difficult. I found it very difficult over the years to find any other way of soaking your brush besides laying it down, and then you've got a puddle of water. Okay, so that being said, that's been soaking there, we're going to get out Hauser Dark Green. Okay, we're going to open up our brand new bottle of Hauser Dark Green. Incidentally, as I did that, I realized never open your bottle of paint over your project because they tend to spit when they're brand new and you never know how much paint's going to come out of there. We're going to thin our paint. We're going to thin it like ink. Okay. We're going to use our liner brush to thin it. Let me get you over there. Okay, I'm just going to drop some water right there. You could also mist. You could use some of the little misty spots you got. Okay, and I'm fully loading this brush. You do not, I know it's an expensive brush, but I will tell you this brush will last you for 20 or 30 years if you use it right. Like if you treat it right. You know, don't lean it on its head and all that kind of stuff. So I want ink-like consistency, very thin. I'm going to dry off my ferrule. Okay, so I'll just dry it, and then I'll load. I don't like the ferrule being wet because then my hand slips and slides and all that kind of stuff around. All right, so now I've got a fully loaded paintbrush, and I'll show you on paper here what this will do. Is it will... Go and 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 go. And this is just a freshly loaded one, just soaked the first time. The longer you float or the longer you line, the longer your brush will go. Okay, how many of your liner brushes that you own now will do that? And it will keep going and it will keep going and it will keep going and it will keep going. Okay, and it's not stopping, but I think it's enough. I think I could make you nauseous. So I don't want to do that. 
So what I'm going to do now is show you on here. Load my brush. And now I'm going to make a whole ton of pine needles. Okay, so we want to just use sweeping kind of motions like little eyelashes all going in the same direction. And we'll flip it around a little bit and get you in closer. Okay, they're kind of big long eyelashes. I'd give them maybe, how long are they? Oh, not quite an inch. Okay, and you'll find that you probably eyelash better one direction than the other, but it's important that you start your your stroke here in the middle because if you don't it'll be heavy at the ends you don't want to line in from the outside That's, that will not work I'm gonna do a second pass with that and I'm gonna do these a little bit shorter and I'm gonna bring them in kinda of from the opposite side of the tree a little bit like they're overlapping Okay, and the idea is just to make a million of them now I could use a rake one thing that you also don't want to do is you don't want them to get curly or straight, like both together. You want to do one way or the other. I could use a rake, but I don't really have a lot of really fine lines all together. Here, do you see how there's quite a bit? That's almost a quarter inch of space. So this maybe isn't the spot for me to use a rake. A rake would be a very good choice for other applications. So then I'll go over and I'll treat this little guy right here. This will be, if we can paint, this will be a little bit, I'm going to bring it out past its branch. Come over here. This one I'll extend into it. Now overlap them. Decide who's dominant and let them, let them duke it out, you know, let them go ahead. Okay. Bring in... I'm using quite a bit of pressure. I think one of the things that I'm finding is this is a pretty big area. Like I'm, I'm making big needles. I'm not doing little tiny eyelashes here. Um, and so as I'm doing that, I'm going to just create a couple of extra background ones. Pretend. A little background fluffy filler stuff. That's got no... Um, no branch holding it up. We don't need branches for everything. And we can even go ahead and create one back here. The more in the background something is, the more faint it's going to be, or the more neutral in color. So we want to just put some green back there, like, hey, something else is going on, and there's a whole tree holding that thing up. I did not do myself any favors choosing the size of project to keep on camera. Those of you who have followed um, the videos for a while know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so get these going on. Make it a little bit more defined. Maybe I want some back here just to break that up back there. Sweeping it with my finger just to pretend. You've got to turn your piece. If you don't turn your piece around and get multiple angles on it, um, you will find that you have very clunky looking um, pine needles. They will not be natural and flowing. I have almost used up half of my paint over there, so this is telling you the size of this really is quite, um, I guess, impressive as far as i got to get more water and more paint out. Um, Normally when I line, I don't <clears throat> ever use up even the uh, initial puddle. You could make this pattern any old stinking size you wanted to, too. You know, he'd be cute with just the bird without the words. He'd be cute on anything. I encourage you to, to try things in different ways. Don't, um, don't just always do it the way that it's published because you'll find so many cool surprises. Okay, so he's it behind. Okay, we'll do these outer ones first. Just bring them right on in over the snowflakes. Don't even worry about it at all. Now, I don't know, there's probably about 100 strokes here on this little thing that I just lined, and, you know, I didn't have to reload my brush. 
there's, you know, the time, time is so important in learning. Last month, my husband had his scare with health, and this is, um, time is the most important thing. So when you're using your tools, if you've got something that's saving you time, I think that that's very valuable. And besides the fact that that's the most amazing line of brush ever, we won't go there. Okay, so just go ahead and just litter this thing with the pine needles. This little guy right here seems like he needs to have another extra little branchy poo coming out over here. So I'm just going to give him a branchy poo. Doesn't have to really exist. Um, I'm going to re-establish over here. Bring that down. And then re-establish this guy on top. There you go a little war right now, but we'll fix him. We'll do some color and stuff later. I think we'll bring some. We've got a lot of movement, a lot of lines all going in the same direction. I think we'll bring this one over here out in this direction. And I don't want that over my... I want him behind that branch. And so we'll just keep sneaking out. This is what I was talking about with why we're doing the background first. I'm making all these funny efforts to um, not draw on my branch to make that come out. What you can do is pull out something like a Q-tip. Okay, these have super, super, super hard, um, very absorbent, um, scrubbable cotton tips. Very much like a cotton swab, but they're super duper different. Um, anyway, but now I can go right over that. As long as I work while I'm wet, then I can just go in and I can erase it off, and no problem. And these um, don't really wear out. You know, the other ones, their little um, noggins get all like, and bad hair days and stuff. These, you can let them dry, and the next day they'll absorb just as much. So don't throw them away when they get dirty, <clears throat> because they still last and they still keep. Okay, so maybe we want a little friend to go on through here in that same direction. We just need some filler to show that this is a full tree. Once you get them back there, you're not going to care about what's holding what up. This one seems like he needs to have some extra little branch here. Don't want all the branches ending in exactly the same spot. That's super important. It's not very interesting to see. You don't want them all starting in the same place. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish the top half of this. Let me back you up a little bit. See where I'm at. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish the top half um, and just do it in exactly the same way. And then I'll finish my um, upper branches as well. Um, it's a lot of repetition, and I don't want to bore you to tears. Okay, on that note, what I have right now is I have no, no greenery really flowing over any branch. That's not a good idea. So we need some of these backgroundy things to actually come over the tops of some of the other branches. So we need to decide on some dominant branch activity. And that will give us some depth and dimension. I'm going to pretend like there's one coming off of this bottom, um, bottom branch here. And I'm just going to bring it right on over the top of that puppy. You can take a look and see where things look like they should be crossing. <clears throat> and this guy right here looks like he needs something. Now I'm going right through that bird. If I didn't go right through that bird, I would have like a halo effect around the bird. And you wouldn't want that. So super duper duper important to work in the background in most cases. Like don't um, don't take me too seriously. Like there's no exceptions. There's always exceptions. And everybody has opinions as well. So let's bring something out from this guy. I'm working right through my bird. Just keep kind of looking for ways to overlap things. We want to overlap. Oops, my paint is drying out. 
you'll know when your paint dries out, it will not flow off the brush. Um, it's important to have these overlaps, and I wanted to tell you that further out you get from your center of interest, like our bird is obviously going to be our center of interest, the further away you get, the less detail you should be and the softer or less brilliant in color. So remember that thing about <coughs> more detail gets more attention. You don't want contrast either. Contrast is another way you get attention. So if I have black and white way out here and this is soft pink, obviously my attention is going to come down here. So um, make sure that you don't put too much giant detail in these outer edges of branches. So this back here needs some kind of green. Let's show another little trick. I haven't done my top little viney poos yet, but I'll start here. We're going to take a <clears throat> bristle scumbler. Okay, it's just a nice cheap brush. I'm going to take a paper towel, and I'm going to dip into just the Hauser green. I've got it pretty watery here. I don't mean that. A little bit of watery Hauser green, no water in my brush, and I'm wiping it off on the paper towel. And what I'm going to do is go, yeah, it's too watery. You need not watery paint to do a, a rub. So I'll put out fresh paint, because I used up all my other. And then I'll rub it all off on the paper towel. Got to be careful with this, because this is a pretty dark color. Look how strong that is compared to that blue. So I want to go in next to my bird, staying off of my branches-ish. And I want to create background green, like there's a tree or a forest of trees back there. Or that, you know, the birds, they don't. When we watch our birds, we, we call it bird TV at our house. Um, got all the planters outside the, the front window. And in winter winter time, you can just sit there for hours and just watch bird TV, you know, and it's a, so amazing and wonderful. So what I want to create... So what I was going to say is the cardinals do not sit in like on the edge of the top of the tree. They always sit inside our evergreen trees. At least at our house, that's how it works. So I want to give it that illusion of that bird sitting within a tree instead of only on or next to a tree. So we're just going to deepen these areas. And then that fills, fills in the voids just a little bit. It's not so stark looking. <clears throat> we can put that right next to our bird just to give him some spot of green for blocking. Okay, I think that we'll stop there with that and then just a little bit. This is an excellent, I call this a dry rubbing technique. This is great for shading and highlighting fruit, and these brushes are fantastic because they're cut in a really domed way. So when you are, let me use our paper exampler again, when you need to highlight or shade in a big area with smoothness, we'll pretend, let's see, we'll pretend like we have a piece of fruit. So we'll pretend like it's a pear, and we will pretend like this is the highlight color. Obviously, it's going to be dark, so you would pretend like this was a dark piece of fruit, and then now he's doing a highlight on there. But if I want to highlight the, this pear in just this belly area, a back-to-back -back float or a, a round float is tricky. Like, I could do it, but I don't want to. It's a lot of work. <clears throat> so you can just easily add shading and detail, and I'm leaning back on my brush. Notice my angle is not here. My angle's back here. I'm starting in the darkest area first, and I'm just rubbing, and that's why I call it a dry rub. The brush is dry, the paint is dry, and um, you dry it off on the paper towel, okay, so, and you're rubbing, so. Some people call this dry brushing. Um, there's another bunch of people that are doing dry brushing, and it's a wet brush with a wet technique. It just looks like dry paint, so I call this one dry rubbing and the other one dry brushing. But we'll get to that another day. All right, so then you'll notice some dust and you just blow that off. Look at how nice that is. It's darker in the middle. It fades to the outside. You don't have any harsh, harsh stop and start, stop and start marks. If I wanted to extend my float with this, I could float along here and then I could just shape following rub to extend the float way out. Real easy way to extend your float too. This is a valuable technique to know about.
we're going to use the same technique to put green in behind this top section. My brush is almost dry. It's really dangerous to use an almost dry brush um, on dry brushing um, or dry rubbing. Sorry, now I'm doing it. Rub, 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 because you'll end up making a wash, and the wash looks totally different than this dry rub technique. But I think it really does feel like it's about dry. So a lot of these brushes, we've got the crescent stencils and the crescent, um, the dome stencils and these, um, the Fitch scumblers and the bristle scumblers are all about the same kind of technique brush. Um, just get yourself a handful of them. They're cheap. They wear forever. Um, you know, just get a bunch of them so that you always have a dry one and you don't ever have to try to do this with a wet um, brush. With a wet, yeah, dry, dry brush. I actually just now closed my eyes while I was doing this. Um, this technique is so simple um, that you can literally close your eyes or not pay attention very closely while you're doing it and no problems great way for beginners to shade or yeah to shade and highlight is to just rub it on as long as they can tell where they're going and they should be good okay so right here I got a little bit I pressed a little bit hard let me show you a trick you can use this eraser you can dip it into water while paint is fresh it will take fresh paint off but you'll note it's not taking off my blue paint. Okay, so I just dry that off. And it's like I've started all the way back at scratch. That is an awesome erasing, you can erase paint. Who knew that? Okay, so I'll wait for that to dry and then I'll do a little bit more scumbling in that area. Obviously your surface needs to be dry as well. I don't want this too green up here. Too green would be, meh, it would just be like I was trying to be green and I, I don't want it to take away the blue. Okay, so we'll go back in that area. Gentle pressure because it was wet and we've already established that Rocklawn dries a little bit slower than we think it's going to. Okay, now we'll go on to our next. Now it's safe for me to wash this brush, by the way. I'll just go ahead and give it a scumble in the water. excited about this project. I have wanted to work on these um, banners um, for the stand and then you know that there's a garden stake for that as well. Um, like you can put it in your pot or in your in your garden or whatever. Okay so now we're going to go to Hauser medium green. We'll just move up our Hauser family here and we'll put that out and we'll use our liner and we're going to do the same thing. We're just not going to do so much of it. Okay so remember with lining, it's super important to get that water in there. Okay, I note I've got a little bit of dirt blue in my in my water. I don't care. It's in the background. It's um, just going to tint it just a little bit. Working within the family of colors is always the best thing to do. So I'm not going to worry if I have just a little bit of a drop of coloring in my brush or in my yeah in my water. Okay, next we're going to go a little bit lighter. Now what's going to happen here is going to be something interesting. We're working into, like, this color sits back on the background a lot better than this dark color because this background is a medium color. This is a medium green. And that's why we have this eraser. <laughs> it's because I'm a knucklehead. And I dip it in my little dot of water and I can erase that line right off of there. Okay. So as I lighten, I might end up lightening it to make it be so that it's harder to see these boughs against the background. And that is not my intention. So what I want to do is just add a, one layer of different color up the middle, kind of keeping it a little bit shorter and not so many lines as that darker green. I just want to add another dimension. I'll get you in close for a second so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so you can see the before and the after. This is kind of spindly. This looks much fuller. It's also got a little bit different dimension to it. So we'll add just those. Okay, just to give it a little bit more fullness but not more darkness. Another thought on our greens is in these areas back here, 
we wouldn't want a green that was like sunlit green and that's like a yellower green right so we don't want to go back here with more sunlit green i'm going to keep that out to the more outer edges and the top the top stuff the stuff that's sticking out those are the ones that ought to get some of this yellow green all right next we're going to skip hauser light and move into foliage green is it foliage green it's foliage green it's a light, 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 light yellow green. And we're going to make it runny and watery. Dry off our ferrule. And then we're going to use this color right inside the main body of, we don't want these to look like they have holes. We want it to look like there's a little bit of a highlight going on. So we're going to keep it inside. Just put a little bit of it. Okay. And that will just give it a little bit like it's got a little bit of a green kind of um, being kissed by the sun touch. The ones that are back tucked in, we don't do. All right, that is where we've got our colors so far. And now I think we're going to go ahead and wash on the color on our bird and go ahead and start basing his little, his little body in and we'll see where we go. Um, I always leave the lettering to last just to make sure that I know where I'm going. Um, you could certainly, anytime you feel like it, because you've got instructions and things like that, um, you could go forward and you could do your lettering now. Um, and then we'll see if we need any more detail on branches and more sunshine on our, our, um, our needles and stuff like that as well. So we'll start with our bird. Okay, now I'm going to go into the oranges. Every picture of these birds that I saw, even though they look so red, when I held up the colors and I really tried to match the colors, every stinking one of them pulled orange. So I'm going to base my cardinal in a wash of cadmium orange. And with washes, we want to kind of move quickly so they stay even. I'm blotting on my paper towel to not puddle. And I'm trying to find my pattern lines. I'm going to move quickly. I'll go back and even things out. Soften that right there where it ends. A wash by definition is 80% water, 20% paint. We blot on our paper towel, then we can continue washing. I don't really want to outline him because then I'll end up with lines all over the place. So we just move quickly and wash him in. Keep going up and wetting the areas where you're working <clears throat> helps as well. Okay, If we get some lines and things like that, it's okay. We can make them go away. Okay, now I'm getting to the point where I can't tell where my pattern lines are. I'm also getting to the end of the bird. I'm going back up and I'm just working it to even it out. I'm a little bit nervous of using this orange color. That's why I'm going so faintly. Now I need my pattern. <clears throat> See if I'm anywhere near the ballpark. Okay. It goes right through the branches. A lot. Now, if I'm washing and I've got that bird right through the branches, then all my leaves, my needles are going to show. I think I messed up that line. I think it's going across this way. So washing isn't going to work for a long-term solution for me here, but it is going to tell me where, um, whether my color is going to work or not. So, and I think it is, so I'm going to go back in and give it a little bit more aggressive base coat. Still with some water. I don't know why I'm not liking the idea of trying to base coat with this. And let's talk about these needles. If we're washing this bird on, I really don't think a base coated bird is going to be the look I want. And you know how. Some just look so color book and storybook and stuff. I'm wanting this a little bit more nature-y looking. 
And I've got those pesky pine needles that I told you I wasn't going to worry about, that I'm now worried about, going right through the tail of my bird. So what do I do about that? Okay, let me show you in just a second. Get that nice, and that second coat just kind of makes him a lot more orangey. I think the strokes and stuff are going to make him be um, real, um, a more interesting looking fellow. Okay, so what do we do? We're going to go into just the winter blue. Put a drop out of my palette. That was one of the mixes for our background color. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back right over our tail of our bird with winter blue because the white in the winter blue is going to mask those um, branches and what do you call those things? Pine needles. Okay, anywhere else? Yeah, I got a couple. Come on over here. Now up here I want to keep that a little bit more even because that's, um, we don't, I'll have to wash it to make it even down here. I'm not so worried about it. Okay, I don't have any, any other areas. What I am not liking though is I'm not liking how this goes in one side of him and then out the other side is just a big V of blue. Don't like that one bit. So I think I need to go back into my liner brush, back in my dark green, put you on camera. I think I need to make some of this stuff come out this direction. I'm going to go right into my bird. There's always a fix, right? I'm just going to blend that into him. Don't like that giant V. Okay, did I fix it? That's the question. I think maybe. Yeah, we'll leave it with that. Okay. So as soon as that stuff dries, then um, I've got to tell you, on these Raphaels, here's how I clean them out. Go into my water basin, and I just swish. And the nice thing about the sides of this is they're tall enough you can swish without it splashing things around you. And I rarely will ever use anything. I don't use brush cleaner on this. I don't use soap and water. I don't use almost anything besides just a swish of water. And I think because they're natural fibers, they come clean, whereas the synthetic synthetic, I think, grabs the paint. So a lot of you have asked, how do you take care of these? You, you can reshape it if you want, but gosh, I tell you, I just stuff it in my brush basin, in my, yeah, my brush basin, and don't even worry about it. Okay, let's see. That's nicely masked down there. Good job. We'll go back and get some more of our washi orange, and we'll go back over here and and we'll go for our third wash. We're not after anything other than maybe intensifying the color. But I don't want that even, even base coaty thing going on. Of course, when you guys watch this, you know, you're just, I'm designing this like on camera, so you get to be a part of all the decisions that I make and how many times I change my mind, I can't even begin to tell you. So, you know, I say I don't want it base coated and then later who knows what I'll end up doing. Notice I'm just doing a little bit of an egg beatery kind of oval pattern to my swiping. That allows me not to have stop and start marks. If I start here and do this, I'll end up with square marks all over my bird. This way, I just get a nice soft look. <clears throat> okay, his beak is basically the same color as his face. So right now we'll just give him a wash. Got, his, oh, got a blot. If you don't blot, then what you get is a big blob. His mouth slightly open. like there. Yeah. Right, next we need to make his face or his mask or whatever this thing is called here black. It's good old lamp black. 
little bit of water in your paint will make it flow better. Not very much. When you're working in smaller areas, you don't want to um, you don't want things to be too soupy. A round brush will flatten out if it's a good brush and make in make itself into a flat so you can grab a round here so that you have some dexterity and then you can flatten it to get a good crisp line. This is once again the round pro. As I'm looking at my reference material I realize that the mask is kind of, this part of the mask is kind of the end of his eye and I have a wash of red on here so I'm going to adjust my pattern and I'm erasing my black paint so that I can wash the red without getting crazy with my black. So I've dipped, this is a um, tri, a triple threat eraser and when you push this down you can pull the eraser out and it's pointy like this when you get it and then when you use it of course it, it, um, it gets dull and so what I've done is when I need an edge I go ahead and just snip it off with a pair of scissors and then I've got a nice um, nice edge again. So I'm going to wash in that area with my orange. And fill that in and then I'll figure out what shape that needs to be. But yeah, keeping an eraser around that you can use that, um, that you can wet to erase marks is perfect because I would have had a dickens of a time matching my colors right here. And now I don't have to worry about that. We'll let that dry and I'll apply a second coat. One of the other things that I've decided as well is that I've got to extend my, um, my branch isn't heavy enough to do what it's doing in this picture. So I'm going to grow it with a wash of the original color of cocoa. So pull it straight off the edge and I'm going to grow it over here as well. Just needed some additional weight. And some of that's going to get cut off. That dry too. So that gives it a little bit more body for what it's doing over here. Okay, while I'm waiting for things to dry, I'm going to put Brilliant Red Berries on my tree. I'll need some up above as well. Um, we can have some of these sticking through the branches and we can have some on top. Well, this could be a behind one. It's just a wash of the Brilliant Red. Looks like one coat will do it. If you don't think it's doing it for you, you could give it a second coat. Okay, we just want those to be like, hello birdie birdie food. and poke out from behind branches and things. Once again, I'm using my round. Flattens out nicely. Does a good C stroke and then fill in with the flat. These brushes are the ones that when I was studying to do my CDA, um, I took a class with an MDA and the brush that and she was um, we were doing stroke work and stuff like that what well, we did a combination but the brush that was recommended during that class was this brush in all of its sizes for its perfect strokes and it's um, just line work it just finishes it does it does everything it should and it does it right and I don't can't think of a better recommendation than that any of you that are not familiar with the MDA or CDA process, it's a stringent um, certifying um, program that's done by the Society of Decorative Painters. You can look them up online. And um, it's just a real good challenge. If you haven't tried it, it's a real good challenge for yourself. I know my skills improved. I didn't pass, but my skills improved greatly. Um, I need to have a little bit of this red behind him. He's going to get a little bit of this red on him, 
Um, I just haven't quite decided um, how much or where yet. Okay. The ones that are going to be really prominent I'm giving a second coat to. And kind of that will have a little bit more details or that the green is showing through kind of a lot. Okay, so I like that. I want to start shading our bird. I'm going to use an angle shader. Um, okay, so I've got my, <clears throat> my angle shader and I've got a pretty good size one. Angle shaders are different than other brushes. Um, the little ones make awesome roses, <clears throat> but the bigger you go, the better they make for backgrounds and choppy types of textures and smoothly floated big areas. <clears throat> the way you blend, sorry, sorry about that. The way that you blend um, an angle shader is you go this direction. Let me blot that a little bit. This direction, and then you cut across this direction. Pressing really hard. Pressing really hard. Pressing really hard. You could blend, blend, blend this direction, but with an angle shader, it's a good thing to have both sides blended, and you, you'll find that you use both sides. Okay, on that note, I'm going to go in here, and what I'm going to do, because our bird brain over here, Mr. Cardinal, um, I'm going to start by chiseling, so I'm just going to angle in here, and then I want him a little bit fluffy. I'm going to darken him up just a little bit. I'm just going to shove, I'm like shove, shove, shoving the toe of this brush. Okay, I want just a little bit, this isn't quite dark enough to give me the textured look I'm looking for. <clears throat> Okay, but I can come in here and I can add some more texture. Just want a little bit of choppy feel to it. I'm strengthening the color. Oh, the color here is ox blood. And then on his head, I'm going to decide what I'm doing with his um, black mask. Got all kinds of uh, resource pictures down here by me to paint these. All artists use resource pictures. I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for clumping all artists in an all artist category. But um, a friend of mine who is a formally trained artist taught me. I always thought that artists drew and sketched and painted out of their head. And that is not actually the case. They use reference materials. And the reference materials might be a photograph. It might be um, just some kind of inspiration. Now that doesn't mean that their idea isn't out of their head, but if you're painting a canary or a, a cardinal, then um, you need to know what a, a cardinal looks like, right? Okay, so we're just going to go ahead. It gets pretty dark on his backside here. And I don't care about the choppiness. See how he's getting a little bit deeper in color? Very attractive. Now I'm going to use the other side of my brush because I'm going to lead with that toe. And I think I want to go ahead and chop him a little bit of a tail, um, let's see, tail layers. So we'll make one layer, then we'll use our brush and do another layer, and then maybe another layer, and then we'll chop in some lines of, so see how I'm using that chisel? I'm just dragging that in. That's going to start forming. Now, I will never be one that will um, do a real realistic looking bird, but um, some of the details on the birds are, I think are important. I've got a little bit of wing detail. Goodness. Construction going on in the building. So I'm just going to start putting that wing detail in with the ox blood using stronger paint. doesn't have to be exact. Just starts adding some something to it. We can have a little bit of that going on back here, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. Okay, I think I'm liking that. Now underneath his, I'm going to wash my brush out and show you how fine you can go with one of these big size. This is a 5 8 To do a fine and tight um, blend, you're going to just get the little bit of the chisel toe into your paint, 
and you're going to blend real, I want it dry, you're going to blend real, 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 real small, real tight. Then when I come down here, I'm going to just tuck the toe into where I want it. The neat thing about these brushes is that their toe tucks into places. All right, I'm absolutely terrified to do this, but all of my reference pictures show black inside the um, the bird's details on the back part of this feather. So I'm going to do a washy black float with my angle shader, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and with the terrified screaming of putting black in the middle of my red bird, I'm going to go in here and add some black. Whoops, hello, it helps. Okay, so guess what? This is where we need, now on one hand it could help my painting and give it more texture, but on the other hand it's not the line I wanted to make. Told you I was terrified. Okay, let's get the right angle. What was I afraid of? Okay, let me get rid of the palette. Squunch around this way. And give him some black layers. I don't want to make it a black tail. Get you in a little bit closer. And this is belly. No, oh, just the wing tips. I think a little bit more. Okay, let's see how that works for us. We're going to shade our berries now. I'm going to use the same size brush. I'm not trying to be a show off. And black plum. A little bit too wet. Black plum is such a yummy color. I want the concentration of color on the tip. And I'm going to use this to shade my little berries here. And believe it or not, this ginormous brush does a perfect sea stroke and you can shade perfect little tiny berries every time. Okay, just reload. I'm reloading right from my float, my blending strip. Little sea stroke. See how perfect that is? No effort. I'm just on my tippy toe for the little ones, flat on the others. A C stroke looks like this. It goes here and you just shove into the letter C. It starts here, you end here, and you go like that. I'm getting dry because I'm on paper. And it doesn't, you don't turn your brush at all. A larger brush carries more water, which you have to be careful of, but because it carries more water, you can float farther. Okay, now if I had, um, if I was not on paper, you could see, but look at how small those strokes are. Okay, so that's why I can do these tiny, tiny little berries. When you paint on um, paper, it sucks up all the water out of your brush. That's why they always look dry. Using both sides of my brush. Okay, that's nice. Oh, these little guys got lonely. I'm wondering about putting just a teeny bit of let's put, let's float a little bit of our red that was our berry red into. I'm going to use my angle shader into the belly of the bird. I'm going to red him up a little bit into the wing. Just really a wash. I'm just adding just a little bit of water and making him just a little bit more red. 
So now he's got some orange and some red and some all kinds of things popping up through there. Okay, we'll get his beak done. His beak is going to be shaded with um, I'm going to shade first with the cadmium red because I didn't do too many layers on him. I'll give it just that little bit of a cute tip. Spit on it and pull that off of there. Really, one Q-tip would probably do you for your whole project. I think I just lost mine from yesterday. Okay, so I'm liking this. What I'm wanting now is a little bit of orange in my tree, which is kind of an orangey tree. Oh, I also need to shade where I um, need to shade with the milk chocolate where I made my branch a little bit more substantial. And I can do that with the exact same brush that I'm using for everything else right now. And just pull those colors around. And maybe we need to pull a little bit more of that color in since it's a double wash um, pixie type thing. All right, so I think for our little bird's eye, I don't think I'm gonna use that ginormous brush I think I am going to switch to a tiny microscopic number two flat in good condition. Number two flats get in bad shape fairly easily. I don't know why. You don't do much with them, but they just seem to do something to themselves. They self-destruct, but they're so needed. When you need one, you need one. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch out my water. Then I'm going to grab a little teeny bit of my winter blue, and this is not a brush in good condition. I'm going to try and make it work. So I'm blending that out. I want a really fine float. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and float under his little eye. Okay, that worked. And I don't think he gets a little dot to wherever he's looking. Okay, and that's my little bird eye. I don't know if it's bright enough. We'll see. that'll probably work. And all of our berries need to get a little dot of highlight as well. I think we'll try the winter blue. I'm going to switch to the Mighty Fine Liner because it just has such a fine little tip right from the beginning. You could use a stylus as well. I'm not a big fan of pulling out a stylus unless I need to. Let's make a little shine mark. Oops, this is too much paint. on all of our little berries. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to get you in closer. Go on these guys right here. Okay, just do little shines and make them little realistic little berries. Our bird beak needs just a little bit of detail. And I think we'll use the soft black. And I'll thin it with a little bit of water. And I want to do the detail of his, um, his actual, the line of his beak in between, like his two upper and lower beak area there. And I've got mine with his mouth open. I'm just going to scribble with my Mighty Fine Liner, that little opening. And do a little sideways kind of scribble. That gives him, doesn't he look a little bit more realistic now? Okay, and we could shade the sides from side to side. Let's see how well we can do with this um, ginormous. I'm going to go in with just a teeny bit of the soft black. And here's what I'm going to do. And rungs. Okay. I'm going to lace the top of my brush. Now, can you see that? It's not really on an angle. It's just at the tippy tip top. And then I'm going to shade or blend a lot my brush. That keeps it really narrow. Blot my brush again. I've got this carries so much water, you want to be careful about that part. Now let's get you on camera. So I want to bring this down. Let's give him a little dimension. Yeah, that's nice. Do 
And the same for the... Now look at, I'm turning my brush on the chisel. I need just a little bit more paint. It's not quite dark enough for me. I'm turning it on the chisel and I'm going to drag it away from the beak. Okay. And I could do this side, but I can't see, so I have to turn it around. I have a little bit of cleanup here. I'm going to go into a little bit out of my line. Go in there and scrub that out. And then I'll do the same thing here, a little bit darker. And I can go out onto the end. Let's clean up my mess. Yeah, now he's got a nice little beak. We probably could give him a teeny bit of a little bit of a highlight of some sort. Not really certain what that should be. Seems like he needs something there. I'm going to go into cocoa and highlight. Oops, too watery. And once again, what do I tell you? You've got to be able to see where you're going. So you have to be on the right side of your brush. If your eyes are trying to peer behind your brush, you're doing something wrong. Okay, that gives him just a little teeny bit of a highlight that was with Coco. At this point, I'm going to use a little bit of washy soft black to do my little toesies grabbing on to whatever they're grabbing on to. I am not a bird foot um, fan. I have no idea how they're supposed to look, so we're just going to give it a couple of little claw type things. I know there are those of you who are much better at this than me, so we're going to hide these things in amongst the greenery and not worry about it. Make them soft. At least something is down there that we are know, or know is supposed to be down there. All right, at this point, I think it's time to think about our lettering and the finishing at the top because I've got a nice little expression on my little cardinal's face. I'm liking that. And we'll see after we kind of get going what else we need. All right, we're back to look at the lettering. So here's what I'm doing. I'm looking at the overall piece. I know that my lines are about here. I know that I've got this branch coming out from up there. My letters are here and here. I'm looking at all this red down here, and I can't think that this is going to have to just absolutely be red letters. Um, I can't think of any other way to go about it. Um, I could do them brown, but I really think it needs to balance all this red that's down here. So we'll see what we can do and um, we'll see what's what and we'll get them based in red. So what we're going to start with that is um, we're going to use the fantastic number two round pro because it is the bomb. And we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to do them in the same orange. And this is not a very good color for this. Um, we may go ahead and do them in ox blood. Um, oh, I've got Georgia clay out too. Hmm. Maybe we'll do them in Georgia Clay. And the reason I'm saying that is um, cadmium colors are always super duper transparent. They don't base coat worth crud. Okay, and so if you want a base coat and stay there for 118 years on one letter, then use a cadmium color. But if you want to get done, then um, switch to something else with a little bit of um, extra stuff in it covering pigment, I'm not sure. They're just pure colors and that means that they just aren't highly pigmented. Alright, so I'm going to flat load into Georgia Clay. Load it in there nice and juicy, but not too juicy. Depends on how big my letters are. And then I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to flatten that brush out. I'll have to reload frequently because I'm not doing this with a lot of water. I could have just a teeny bit of water thinning. Depends on how my brush is doing. I've seen a lot of painters, like I teach classes all over the country, and I've seen a whole ton of painters do this kind of action with their letters. And if you are one of those people, it's fine. But what I want to show you, what I hope that you can get from this, um, if you happen to be one of those, it doesn't have to be that hard. Painting really isn't hard, it's just learning good habits and good techniques. Let me show you what I would do. Put just a teeny drop of water in my paint, just so I don't want to thin it. I'm going to start up here on my toe. I'm straight up and down on my brush. I put water in my brow. I really hate that. That makes you lose control. 
Okay, so I'm going to start on here on my tippy toe, and then I'm going to come around the corner, I'm going to press as I'm coming around the corner, and then I'm going to lift. Then I'll come over here and make my second stroke to finish that off. Clean it up. But really, in just a few very short strokes, you can make a really pretty letter. And do me a favor, if you go just, like I just went in a little ink out of the line there, don't worry about that. Um, just, if nobody's going to know, they're not going to have a pattern. They're not going to put the pattern over your lettering. Um, so just, you know, accept that. If it's really wonky, go ahead and fix it. But remember the eraser trick. Please, 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 please. If I screwed up this whole letter right here, I'm going to dip my eraser in the water, and while it's fresh, I'm going to erase it. While it's dry, this doesn't take off any paint whatsoever. As soon as it's wet and on fresh paint, it removes whatever your mistake is. I hope that those of you who are watching this, who have made it this far with us, because I know that sometimes it's hard to find time to watch a long video, I hope that those of you who are still with us, um, write us and tell us what you think, um, what, you, what your favorite part was, review the products on the website so that you'll help other painters make good choices. That is, like we do this um, to help y'all learn, and so the way you can help us is to review products and help other customers. That is a wonderful thing. Okay, so we're just going to go through, and I'm going to give all these letters some um, the same treatment. Oh, didn't quite meet my line. Okay, it looks like about one coat's going to do this. Okay, we're going to do some drop shading with Victorian Blue. And it's going to be all on the left side, using the same brush. Y'all, out of control. Too much paint in my brush. So, what do we do? We take in... And we just fix. Oh, there we go, much better. Okay, they're just going to be all to the left sides. We're just going to line right next to it. I call this drop shading. We can do under as well, if you want. Do a C stroke kind of calligraphy type action. Just gives it some body, adds some dimension to it. If you do underneath, lean to the left on it. Do it fairly thick. A little bit of water in my brush. More of our brilliant red and our brilliant little feathered friend here. So I'm just going to kind of float choppy stuff, make some brilliant red stuff happen there. This beak could be a little bit redder. All right, the other thing that we're going to need, we need some more snowflakes, we need some more things, we need a couple of different um, things going on. So I think I'll add the snowflakes next. I'm going to go into the smaller sized ones, get out the makeup applicator, <clears throat> I'm going to get out cool white. Now it's time to lead a path to where we're going. So this has got the um, stencil adhesive on it and I didn't show you how to do that and I just put him through my, my lovely red bird. I'll show you how to do that next. But what I want to do, so when you're doing your snowflakes, I want to lead you from here to here. And I could do that with color, I could do that with all kinds of things, but I'm going to do it with snowflakes today. Just add, we've got layers. I'm going to do some faded ones in the background with hardly anything on my brush, which is not a brush. Maybe some of these little sparkles. Okay. Bring the eye down to here. Maybe this one needs to be one of these busier. Okay. faded in the background. It needs to look kind of magical. It's time to get a smaller set of snowflakes out. 
Okay, we have a snowflake border. Now, I used this on a video, and I used texture paste, which is all over the top of here. Text, and that's texture paste, this texture glass, and then I did glue and glittered. Um, problem with the glue and glitter is I should have washed it off then, so I think I wrecked my stencil. I will try to get that off and let you know if I'm able to. But this border stencil has a lot of really cool little stencils, so it's important. And they're laid out really neat as well. Okay, we're going to have some coming from over here. Love having all these different snowflake stencils. It just makes it so much fun to create. You could use these on your windows at winter time. Um, you can totally just have so much fun. Grandkids, you know, give them some aprons, let them stencil on some snowflakes. Just amazing. Too much fun. Okay, we need a little bit of sparkle over here. I'm looking at this, I squint my eyes, and I look to see where do I need interest. And what, what needs to be standing out? Oops, that did not work out so well. My adhesive is not very on over there. I think I'll clean him up. Actually, I think I'm going to remove his little tail and dip into water. Just wipe him off. better adhesive stencil. Okay. When it starts um, becoming less adhesive, then what you can do is um, you can just reapply the adhesive after it starts wearing out or wearing off. Somewhere I have found blue. I bet you none of you have ever done this before. You got blue laying right on the middle of my project. But if you catch it early enough, just calmly wipe it off, figure out the source. I've got my blue from my palette over here. Put that there. I don't want to rub white all over it. And then I'm just going to clean that off the back of my stencil. And now I've got the problem contained. And I'll just watch out how I'm doing this. I think I might have enough snowflakes by now. Okay, so now it's kind of leading from here to there, and it looks like the bird is looking at them when you see him close up. Um, okay, so now I'm going to, the one thing you don't want to do with the stencil adhesive is put it on paper. I'm looking for a place to lay this down, and I've got a lot of things with paper um, near me, and I don't want to lay it on paper because then it'll be stuck to paper. Magical little snowflakes. Kind of am wanting something coming up from behind his head. Yeah, there we go. So see, I just laid it on there, and then I just tapped around his head instead of going through his head. All right, so I think that that might be good for now. And then I think it's time to start cutting. So let's talk about how we're going to cut it. I'm going to get rid of my palette. I think I will just throw this away for right now. Yeah, you know what? We need a little bit of highlight on our boards. Uh, maybe glitter. Arr, I hate it when I get into these dilemmas. I think glitter might be our friend. This is just such a fun banner. I think we can have more fun if we have glitter. But in the meantime, how are we going to cut it out? I'll show you. I've got glass palettes on the brain here. Um, this is a glass palette with adhesive, with um, tack it over and over on the um, on the palette. And it used to be strong enough. I've used it many, many times. It used to be strong enough I could lift my hand and lift this palette off. It's not as strong. But one of the things that we're going to run into is I don't want to cut through cardboard because that'll make it like harder for me to cut. And I don't want to cut into my table, and I don't want my rock wand sliding around on me. So I'm going to adhese it onto here, and then this just peels off. So this will hold me steady so that I'm not slipping. Okay, so see, this won't slip around. Um, and then I can cut right on it. And the very first thing I'm going to need to do is decide where my straight line is. And that's going to be a scissor action. 
Okay, so I'll take that away. Reinforce my lines so that I can see where I'm going with this. Another good reason for these um, ghost writers is I can mark on this and should I go through my snowflake or whatever, I don't have to worry about it not being able to come off. I had already marked lines. I'm trying to see where I had marked them. I'm trying to keep it straight. Making big long lines on this does eat up your um, the end of your graphite here just a little bit. Whoops, that's gray. That's push it in to make it come out. Alright, measuring tools, measuring tools are so, so, so important. Alright, so in order for our words to hang nice and straight, we're going to need to make sure that our line is straight. So what I'm going to do is go take out L square, and here at the top, I'm going to L square myself and see if I'm square. And I am ish pretty darn square. Okay, then I'm going to do the other side. <clears throat> if I'm square, then it's going to hang right. Yeah, pretty good. Hey, considering how dorky I am with numbers, it's not bad. Okay. So I've got my two lines down the middle. I'm going to cut out around my snowflake somehow. I'm not going to cut out around my branch, and I'm not probably going to cut out that far on this snowflake. We'll see how I feel about that in a minute. Now I need to decide my path here. So this is a line, and I'm wondering about angles. Let's get out the angle tool because it's just pretty snazzy, snazzy, snazzy. I'm going to put this circle right on, and do I want to do it that? I think I'll do it this way. <clears throat> put that there. I guess we can just open that puppy up. I'm centering this over this circle right here, and ish. Like I said, I can just erase these lines right off of there. Okay. And then, here's what I've got. I've got this around here, and back around here, come around, come around, come around, come around, come around, come around, and I don't know if that gets a little convoluted over here. I kind of didn't want them all samey, samey, but I do think I need another one poking out over here, so I'll fix that. Okay. This, we don't have stuff poking out so far on as we do over here, so I'm not sure... Sure, not sure. Okay, but in the meantime, I do like my straight. I do think my arches are fairly even. I'm going to poke on another stencil over here. Let's get a medium size ish. Let's not use the same one that we've used all over. Something easy to cut around would also be a good idea. Let me do this guy. Okay. And then first I'm going to cut my straights. I'm going to use a little scissor for that. I could use um, another tool, but in this case I think it's easiest with a scissor. Go right on in. And the one thing with the rock lawn is you want to go ahead and just do smooth cuts. Okay, now where I'm going to cut around I'm just going to cut it out. I don't want too many pointy bits, so I'm going to cut that guy off right there. These little gingers are so super sharp. At least they were before I started cutting rock on all the time. So I just cut that out that way and I'll come back to my snowflakes. Let's talk about Zacto knives. And I don't know if this is a Zacto brand Zacto knife. I guess it's a Zacto brand Zacto knife. Um, this bad boy with a padded handle has lived in my painting bucket for at least 10 years. I um, love it because it has a padded handle and it has a lid on it. The problem is, is if you put it down this way, the lid falls off when you take it out and you can never find it again. 
So I've always put it in my bucket this way, and every time I go to take it out by the handle, then the knife comes there, and I've almost stabbed myself eight million times. No exaggeration. Along comes, here's what I need. I need a Zacto knife that doesn't poke out and kill me. Um, so let's see if I can get the packaging out of this. This little puppy right here is a plungeable um, Zacto knife, and it loads it loads with a no-touch, um, what do you call it? Um, okay, that's your used blades go in there, and your new blades, if I can figure out how to open it. Seems like it's fairly well attached. What am I doing wrong? There. Ah, there we go. Okay, so the new blades are in here. It comes with five blades, and you plunge this thing in, and you twist it, and it locks, and it comes out, and then the blade hides in here has a padded handle just like what we need and the blade goes down within the um, with, within the little it goes inside there so now I can put that in there I can grab it out and I can be safe knowing that I'm not going to get cut with a blade okay so reading my little blade instructions you plunge this thing down until you hear it click then you twist it onto the blade until it locks in to place am I doing that right Is it going to lock until, did I do, I didn't do counterclockwise, okay, silly me, it wasn't counterclockwise, it was clockwise, alright, so you do that until it goes into place, and then you lift the knife, sure you do, ah, ta-da, okay, and then you can close that and you've got your replacements and your place to throw away your little blady poos. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to see what kind of detail I want around the outsides of these. Oh my gosh, that cuts supremely. I tested this before I brought them in, but I haven't seen it since I've tested it because we had, you know, product whatever. Um, we had to order them and everything. So I'm just going around the details. Let's see, I want to see how it's going to look before I go too crazy with it. Wow. Nice padded blade, way nicer than a little pair of scissors. Okay, there's that. Yep. Somebody can't cut straight. Alright. Bring that out to a V. It's cutting right on top of the glass. The glass is minding your blade. This is a fantastic way to cut stencils as well. You put the adhesive on your glass palette. You're gonna need two of these. If you wanna mix your paints um, on one of these, you do not want to have glass, um, you don't wanna have it adhesive on top of there. Okay, let's see where we're not quite cut through yet. And get there the tip. Okay, there's that. I don't think I did this one. Okay, there's that. Let's see if it can come off. The tips are where you're going to find yourself. Uh, I didn't even cut that. Hmm. Just put a little dot right there and that'll probably release it. Alright, and then I'm going to clean that one up because I cut it twice. If this wasn't stuck on the glass palette, that would have been just a nightmare to do. Okay, and this is there. You just use the edge of the knife to lift it up. Okay, and this one's done as well. Aha! Alright, now let's lift it off and see how cool that's going to be. I think it's going to be kind of fun. This might be overkill for detail. Um, I'll let you decide how much wear and tear it's going to get. You might just want to go around the outer edges of it. Maybe not so much here. If it's going to be outside, I'd say maybe not. If it's going to be against a wall or hanging on that hanger in your house, maybe yeah. So um, maybe we'll go just for giggles. Let's do this one not so much. Okay, and then where will we go from there? 
Okay, that's all released, yes. Okay. Gosh, that's cool. Let me just pretend how much detail I'm going to do. Now there's another little guy that we've got here, which is the finger blade, the fingertip Zacto. This one would be great in this circumstance too because it follows your finger and you can totally do like zigzags. And you can decide how much detail. Um, put that down there so and show you kind of, let me get a little bit closer for you. And you're going on here, if I totally just want to go in little circles, I can totally just do that. And it, this little guy just swivels around and follows you. It has refills so that it's economical to, to purchase as well. So, you go here. Whatever you do, get something with a comfort grip because there's no need to be super uncomfortable while you're doing this kind of thing. And in this case, you know what? I like this guy for this roundabout detail. How much detail do I want in here? That's the next question. And you can just kind of grip it in the palm of your hand. I like the other one for straight, but I like this one. This is cool. Let's pull this off and see how good we did. You could cut a whole lace pattern out if you wanted to. Okay, I got these little places where I caught. Okay, there, that's. Oops, I didn't even cut there. I'll tell you, this rock lawn is some tough stuff. Okay, now we'll go up here, and yeah, let's go down here, and just give it a little swoop. Okay. Let me take this out so you can see. Okay, I think I don't like it with as much detail myself. I think I'm liking this within detail. I don't know that I'm happy that I went way in here. I think I would have liked it better to have that be filled in. One thing that you could do if you do something and you don't like it, you could take a piece of rock lawn and you could patch that right there behind it and then paint it the same color and then just maybe stencil another snowflake on top of it and you'd never see. So just use some glue and some stuff like that. So I'm in, fa I'm in favor of less detail. So now what I'm going to do is just go ahead and finish my cutting. Um, see what we got. Okay, you guys ready for this? This is so cool. Alright, look at how awesome that looks. Let me get the cutting mat. This is my cutting mat and you can see nothing wrong with it. And oh, I can see my design on it. Um, Fantastic and fantastic. I interchanged and used them both. I picked up scissors and um, tried to do a little straight edge kind of little thing on something and hated it. So look at how cool that looks. Now what we could do, and it's not a terribly, terribly bad idea, is you could put some holes in some of this other area and make it be a little lacy and stuff like that. That would be absolutely um, a great option. I love this with this detail on it. I would not do this. This is wrong. These two areas right here are wrong. This little flapper thing. You gotta give it a little bit more body. You can just go around the outside of that. And I wouldn't cut out like this unless I was going to do that everywhere. And it kind of looks like I tried to do that over here as well. So it's a little bit balanced and I'm not hating it. But love, 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 love that. Now, wouldn't this be fantastic? Pretend like you didn't have snowbirds welcome here. Wouldn't this be fantastic with another bird on the other side, maybe the girl bird? And wouldn't it be great to have it be like a table runner for your dining room table or something? Um, yeah, love this technique. And this little finish at the edge would be just wonderful too. 
Okay, we're going to get ready to do some glittering, but before, before, before you do any glittering, varnish. I have done this backwards eight million times. I never, ever remember to varnish. If your banner is going to be hanging outside, you need to use a polyurethane. This is Duraclair. It's a Deco Art Americana um, varnish. It's a polyurethane. This is going to be the best weather resistant that you can get. Just pour some out. You've got to roll this. Don't brush varnish your banners. Um, you want to use a clean in good shape roller head, which I can't seem to find. Okay, so I'm just going to load my roller brush. we got thin coats. I've got my lines on here from the Ghost Rider. Not even going to worry about them. We want thin coats. Do not use the product called Fini to do your banners on Rocklawn because it makes them shiny, it makes the Rocklawn wrong, and it is is bad for Rocklawn. It's awesome on many other things. I'm not knocking that product, but just don't use it on your banner. I'm just going to roll this right on. I'm going to go in the direction of these little snowflakes. Brush down so that I don't get them all wonked up. The um, rolling on your varnish will also make a nice thin coat so you don't over saturate anything. Just nice and thin. See that um, Ghost Rider just went right away. Oh, I was going to put some snow on my branches. Darn. I may have to do that next and varnish again. Okay, we'll do the back side as well and let it dry. Of course, you won't do this while you're wet. You'll wait until it dries and then flip it over. Just nice. And now I'm using real light texture, real light pressure to make sure I don't get a lot of texture. Nice and thin. I'm using matte varnish. I don't really need any shine on this project because I'm going to glitter it up. It should just take just a few minutes to dry and then I can put another coat on. Put like two coats on each side if you're going to hang it outside and then you can refresh it next year. Okay, the next thing that I want to do and the last thing probably is I'm going to use Delta's Sparkle Glaze. Just seems to work the best. And one of these glitter families, like obviously I'm probably not going to do blue. I want some red. These are the new um, glitter that we get um, that comes in these coordinated colors. Just absolutely fantastic. I use this for the witch's parking. We're going to use the red here today on our letters. And I'm going to get my number two round. Same thing we've been doing all day, right? I'm going to work methodically. I haven't varnished both sides of this piece yet because I want to finish it and just move on. Okay, now we want to always work from the top down. Silly, silly me. Now we've got to work while we're wet too, so I'm going to varnish this or use a sparkle glaze, which is kind of like a varnish. It's got a little bit of glitter in it. It just has a body to it that really grabs the glitter. I don't know why. The chemist in me absolutely wants to know why everything works. But the painter in me just wants it to work. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of letters and then I'm going to glitter, working methodically from the top to the bottom. I could also um, very easily um, go ahead and do some snow on my branches. I haven't decided whether I'm going to do that yet or not. Okay, then I'm going to open my glitter. Glitter, it has little sprinkle holes. And I'm just going to tap, 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 put that on there. That'll make a big difference. Don't want to let it get too dry or it's just not going to stick. I may have let that S dry too long. So you'll work in methodical little, methodical little system. And then um, you'll use your glitter tray to knock the glitter back into so that you don't waste and you don't make a big mess. And then we'll do some snowflake glittering as well. This uh, snowbird's sign is coming just when we are getting tons and tons of snow outside. And it's kind of fun to paint a snowy picture while it's actually snowing. When you paint for magazines and um, things like that, generally speaking, you're painting snowy when it's hot and sunny and Christmas time in 
in the summertime and you just kind of get a little confused. It's kind of nice to have them match. So I hope you enjoy painting this during winter time. Okay, so get that all on. I don't think you need to see me do every letter. I'll show you the knocking off part. All right, I've got all my glitter. I'm going to go ahead and use the big tray since this project is so long. Which I'm going to do. I'm just going to lay my tray. It's got a little hole in this top part that I can um, dump my glitter out. I'm just going to go over here, curve it, tap it firmly. And in this case, I'm going to pop the back with my finger. Yeah, I needed the big tray. Now I could also use a big mop brush and I could scooch that extra glitter off, like sweeping gently. Okay, when I came back in this morning, I had one side varnished and my edges were curly. Flipped it over and I varnished the back side. And I had just a little teeny bit of a whoop. And so what I did was I rolled it up, flipped it over to the back, took a big tube, and I rolled up. It seems to want to stretch in just a little bit. I don't know why it does that, but I figured if any of you had the same problems, you probably want to know what to do about it. So just curl this on over here. And then when I got to the end, I just went ahead and hit it with the blow dryer just to bring these sides back down. They want to, it's, I don't, I don't even know what to describe it with, but, um, once you heat it with the blow dryer, it seems to relax and perk itself right back to where it's supposed to be. And you just uncurl it. Okay. And presto, you're nice and flat. Okay. The next thing that we need to talk about is how to get this um, flap here to stick on the back. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use our tack it over and over. So I'll just put some of this over on my palette and we'll give you just a little flat brush and we'll make some little tabs. You can put it on ish thick, um, but if you put it on too thick it'll turn white and then it'll stick to itself. So you want to be um, careful about that. When it's clear it's ready to use. We have made pet um, hair removers by brushing this on rock lawn. Um, we have made, I'm applying a second coat just to make sure it's nice and heavy enough. If I'm wanting it to adhere, I use a little bit more than normal. Okay, so I'll let that dry until it's clear. And then, um, let's see, the, uh, I wanted to show you on, that's what I use for the, the sticky mat, is I just roll on the tack it over and over again. That's to make the glass palette into the cutting mat. And then the same thing with the stencils. I lay it down. I roll. Once you have your roller dirty, just go ahead and do a whole bunch of your stencils. And then it stays sticky. If you don't want it as sticky as it is, you can blot it on fabric. And then it'll get some lint on it and it'll be a little bit less sticky. One of the things that um, people have asked me about how to clean that off. If you soak it in hot, soapy water with some rubbing alcohol in it. Not hot like boiling hot because you don't want to melt your stencil. But just hot, soapy water. Um, you should be able to get that off. It's a little bit difficult and I haven't taken the time to go do that, but these, leaving these sticky is actually, in my brain, a really good idea. They stick to page protectors. You just stick it on your page protector and then you can hang it with your files or put it in your book. Um, so leaving it sticky. And then somebody else expressed to me that they had gotten sticky on both sides. Go ahead and use it. Like if you want to reverse it, just put your paint right on top of it. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, and it might even then prevent it from being sticky if you didn't want it sticky on that side. So um, that's what I know about how to remove this. Um, I, I don't really care, so I haven't really played with it too much. But I, I will be in the future looking at this. Um, okay, so I have anything else I need to say? Oh, I'm going to show you how to mount that into the holder. Okay, so I've got my stand here, and here's how we're going to put this in here. Just thread this puppy in there, and then you tack on the tacky spots on the back, and there's our finished product.